They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, today, we're going to tap into your Bob Ross and look at your artistic side. So let's talk today about the other side of demand planning and predictive analytics and show you there is an art to it. Let's get to it. Welcome, welcome, welcome! Another exciting episode of IBF On Demand with your exciting host and muse and inspiration for your artistic endeavors, Eric Wilson. And I can be found at eric at ibf.org, eric at ibf.org. So check us out and check out this podcast. You can also get this wherever you download podcasts. We're getting a lot of people downloading these podcasts as well. Or find us on YouTube uh, where you may be watching this right now. We're a community here. So continue to like, share, subscribe, get your friends, like, share, subscribe, talk to your uncles, aunts, have them like, share, subscribe, build this community. And we have a sponsor for today as well, Arkiva. Actually, we've had a sponsor all along these podcasts, which is Arkiva, your one plan, SNOP software solution. Happy to have them on board. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the art side. We're going to get into your Bob Ross. So we're going to talk a little bit about your inspiration in forecasting. We're going to paint a nice picture today. We're going to put a little tree here, a little bridge there, and make this a nice relaxing episode. That's my Bob Ross, the best I could do. Actually, we're going to talk a little bit about you know both sides of it, but more so the art side of it. And I get it. People who say there's an art in statistics or predictive analytics don't understand the science side of it. I would say that people who rely only on the science may be missing a bigger picture. It's a great quote. Albert Einstein says, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. And it is the source of true art and science. That's really what we're looking for, is that inspiration, the art, and the science. There's more than our jobs and just the models. There's, there's really, I mean, yes, the data. Data's messy. We have to understand that. And there's a science in creating that data up. But there's also an art side of it as well. Methods, models, yes, there's definitely a science there, but there's really an art of understanding the features and variables and if it's making sense. And, and look at the output of it. It takes imagination and storytelling to really, and the art side of that as well, to really make the product insightful to others. Everything we look at, I mean, we have to look at our imagination and creativity in what we do to fully do the job that we are looking to be able to do. I mean, has Van Gogh found inspiration in everything around him? Demand planners, predictive analytics. We have hidden creative juices that can inspire us in the entire process that we have. And, and the reason I even got to this topic, because I was inspired. There was I actually was inspired by a LinkedIn post. It was probably a month ago. I was scrolling through my LinkedIn and, and I saw this post from, from a, you know, from my friend, from a, you know, cohort, uh, from, you know, a peer in, in, in the industry named Daniel Fitzpatrick, who was talking about part of his demand planning process and what he did of actually of going to stores and, and I'll let him explain a little bit more about that coming up. But that post inspired me because I've been there. I've done it as well. And I really think everybody should be doing the same things. And it really highlights the, the creative part that we have to do and how we bring that into a demand planning and forecasting process. So with that, I decided like I usually do, if someone's much more knowledgeable about something, which they usually are, than I am, I'm going to bring him in and let them tell you. So I'm excited to bring today in Daniel Fitzpatrick. He has worked in the retail inventory management and demand planning for over 20 years. He began his career working for Office Depot as a replenishment manager and then developed his skills further by working for Walmart. Home Depot, and then most recently, Stanley Tools. 
In addition to working as a demand planner, he is avid writer and he writes and promotes demand planning as a key component in an SNOP process. He's a regular contributor to the Journal of Business Forecasting, demand-planning.com. He's an evangelist for demand planning and forecasting, and I'm excited to have him on board today. So welcome, Daniel. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, excited to have you on board. As I said, you were an inspiration to me in an actual LinkedIn post that you did that that I really liked, I shared, and, and I wanted to bring you on to talk a little bit about what you did that inspired me and, and hopefully inspires a whole lot of other demand planners, but also then talk a little bit about that art side of it as well. So let's start level setting everybody because I, I haven't told everybody what the post was. So can you explain the infamous post that inspired me where you went out and actually got off your desk off your ass and actually went to a store and how that, you know, what exactly what that, what the post was about? Well, the post was about um, getting out into the locations to see the product because to me, the product was still relatively new and I didn't have a physical feel for what it was like, what it weighed, how it looked and where it was in the stores. So I work from home. And I decided every Thursday afternoon, I would take three or four hours and I would go to the various locations, take the product off the shelf and look at it, compare it to other products that were competing with it so that I knew when that number came up, what that product really was. It wasn't a number. It wasn't just a description. I had a sense of who the customer might be, um, what the competition was, where it was in the store, how it was priced. And that insight gave me a lot more information when it came to planning it, because when a salesman would say, we're going to do such and such with this item, I knew exactly what he was planning to do and what the potential impact might be. It, and that's what I liked. I mean, you actually, you left a desk, you left your models and you went out and you actually saw your product in a store. You, you looked at it, you know, smelled it, tasted it, whatever it may be. It, it, so you understood exactly what you're forecasting. And I think that's what a lot of, a lot of planners, let's be right. you know honest, a lot of planners are missing. They don't know what they're forecasting. Right. Right. And I well, think that's and, what you, go ahead. And I think they also don't get a sense of what the customer might be. Because in some cases, if you take it off the shelf and put it on the floor and handle it, you get a sense of, hey, is this like a homeowner who's going to use this? Is this a professional? And then you look at the pricing and think like, no, no homeowner is going to pay that much money for something like this. This is really designed for a professional. And that changes how you forecast it. Because if it's for a professional, they're going to come in and buy it and they're going to use it and they're going to abuse it and it's going to fall apart. And a year from now, they're going to come and buy another one. Whereas if a homeowner buys it, it could last for a decade. So something sold to a homeowner isn't likely to get the repeat sales that someone who uses it every day is going to get. So, I mean, how often would you go in? I mean, this was a weekly process that you'd actually incorporated into your demand planning process of going out and, you know, seeing how the product was sold and how it was shelved and things like that. I mean, that was part of your weekly process is what you went yeah. through. Yeah, every Thursday afternoon. And it was actually a, a, an overall process because I would, as I drove into the location, I would look at the parking lot. Is it full? Is there... Is it clean? Are there carts all over the place? It tells me something about either how well the store is run or how busy it is. And usually Thursday afternoons are not terribly busy. The other reason was by going in on Thursday and seeing what inventory they had, I knew how well they were prepared for the weekend. Because normally they wouldn't get more shipments after Thursday afternoon or Friday. So then I knew, hey, if they're low on inventory on Thursday, by Sunday, they're probably going to be out. And that has an impact on their sales and then, of course, on what they want to reorder. So it was really a, an overall process of, one, getting out and seeing the product. Number two, getting to know where the product is in the store, how well that store is, is run. And I visited, on average, six stores a week. Um, oh, wow. And there were about 25 in my market. So I, the goal was to, to get through the entire market every month so that I knew what was going on with my competitors and also with my own customers. So I had a sense of how well is the business actually running? 
And you, you mentioned the competitors on there. And I think that's another art side we have is really trying to make assumptions about the competition and what they're, and, and that helped you as well going in and seeing how the competition, where they were shelved next, if maybe they weren't an end cap, you know, as soon as you came in and you understand that's going to take away from your sales. And, but really part of that art is making assumptions about competitive skews, I would think as well then. Right. And we do make assumptions and sometimes those assumptions are based on a wrong idea of how the items are actually assorted in the store. What are our items next to? Um, are the other items that it's competing with in stock and available? Are they accessible to the customer? In other words, does the customer have to reach way up on a shelf to get something or is it at eye level or things, or is it way down on the floor where they can walk right past it and not even see it? So it's really a matter of knowing what, where the items are, what the assortment is and how well it's being managed in that location. The other thing I did was when I saw issues like you know, an assortment with five or six holes in it where there's no inventory. I took photos and I sent those to the salespeople saying, in this location, we have an issue. And sometimes it's the product is in the building and not on the shelf. Sometimes it's a distribution issue with the customer. But the bottom line is when the customer comes in, there's nothing for them to buy. I And I've seen that exact same thing before because, uh, you know, I, I've actually went to the stores before. It's a, it's a great, uh, I mean, highly recommend if you're a demand planner, go see your product on yep. the shelves like he did. I mean, that's why I said it was inspiration because I want to see more people do that. And I had that same exact experience where I've went into a store and empty shelf. Right. Talking to the salesperson because I knew we had shipped into that store. So I knew I they had inventory because I, I knew their sell through. I knew what they mm -hmm. had in inventory then. And I seen an empty shelf talking to the salesperson. It was in the back room and it's been right. sitting over there for three days. Yep. Yeah. It, well, and, and in a seasonal business, what I emphasize to the stores is if a customer comes in and wants to buy something that's available only for a limited time or is highlighted for a limited time and they come into your store and you don't have it, they're going to go somewhere else and buy it. Yep. They're not coming back to you. Yep. I tell you, another thing that happened to me as well is one, uh, one time where we baked into our forecast a promotion where they were going to have it as, as an end cap. And that was mm -hmm. going to increase sales according yeah. to sales and marketing by 20, 25% increase right. because it was going to be on an end cap and be more, more visible when you come in. I went into these stores. I didn't see it on end caps. You can't find it. Yeah. You know, it was where it was normally on, on the shelf, you know, and it was a situation where we had baked this in as promotion. We're not seeing, we're not going to see yeah. the benefit if they're not carrying through with it. Well, in some cases, too, you're paying for the floor space or the display for that. So you need the incremental sales to offset what you've already spent. Yep. And I would frequently go in, especially when there were major events. And even if the assortment looked good, I would take a photo and send it to the salespeople because I wanted them to be able to go to the customer and say, this is what the execution in the stores looks like. So that there was confirmation and everybody could look and say, hey, that looks right. This doesn't look right. How come we have, and, and stores execute differently. So they don't always do it. They somehow, have, some have space limitations so they can't do the display the way the, the salesperson might want. But any, in any case, they actually got to see what it looked like in multiple locations. Tell you another thing this might help with, and at least, it, I mean, it helped me, and I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, is you know talking about new products. Sometimes mm -hmm. our expectations of when it's a variable shipped, they then take it, they floor it, or, the, you know, they put it in a planogram, uh, however, the retail, it's not always the same timeline as what we're planning in our forecast. Correct. And you may find that it's not on the floor, you know, for weeks after when you think thought it was going to be on the floor because of the natural, you know, distribution logistics yeah. they have in, in, inside their store. Well, and, and that's always difficult because you're expecting the sales, they're expecting the sales, and they don't come. And then you get the finger pointing like, okay, where's my product? And what we often had to do with new products was I would go in and say, what's the first expected sell date for that product? And then when I went to the stores, is it actually on the shelf? And sometimes it was like, it's, it's in the building because I can see it in their inventory, but it's up yep. in the steel. So I would, I, I used to work for some of these retailers. So I would just go find somebody and say, you need to bring that down and put it on the shelf, um, which wasn't always appreciated, but basically it's my product there's a hole on the shelf for where it's supposed to be and the label sometimes is already there but there's no product 
well, we haven't had time to bring it down. Well, this is your time. Um, and in some cases, I would go in and actually, if I found an assortment that wasn't right, I'd simply redo it because the planograms are almost always available in the store. So I'd get the planogram and reset it. Um, just because without that, I don't know what's there. I don't know what the inventory is. And I don't know whether the assortment for that location is right. I think you hit on a key point there. And one of the things I like about you, Daniel, is because you really, you took ownership of of the product. I mean, it was it was your product. You, my, you said those words. Those are your product. product. So it wasn't yep. like you were, you know, in a cubicle cranking out a forecast of a number. <laughs> right. You owned a process yep. and it was your product. You took ownership of it. And that's one of the things I like about you. And I and I wish you know, I hope you're inspiring some other demand planners today and they get that as well. I mean, is that true? I mean, you felt an ownership yeah. there. Right. Well, and I felt too, it was partly my responsibility to really understand the product, the customer and where it was, where it was set up because with trying to plan without that information is very difficult. And I'll give you an example. We had a bunch of basically small piece organizers, three different sizes. They all look the same but one of them is only one inch high and one of them is three inches high. So one's much deeper. Well, if you look at the pictures, they don't look different, but in the store, they're quite different. And one is obviously designed for one purpose and one for another. But without knowing that, I might plan the two items exactly the same, but they have very different functions. Okay. Now, now I have a, the tough question because I, I mean, I, I agree with, I'm on the same side as you. I agree with everything. But then you'd hear the other side would, would say, okay, if you're going out and you're acting like a salesperson, you're now creating biases. Mm -hmm. So how would you then, uh, you know, as you're going out, you have that ownership now, you're going out, you're seeing the product. How do you incorporate those into the statistical science part of what we do? How do you incorporate that without incorporating your biases into this process or i mean how do you avoid mm. that piece well i think i think you have to be honest and say there's always a bias and basically what i would say is this is what i'm seeing in the stores this is the conclusion i make and my bias is for example that without proper shelf depth presentation we're not going to get the sales we want so an example might be that it's a very expensive product, so the store doesn't want to carry more than one or two. Well, the problem with carrying only one or two is that as soon as you sell those two, you have no more. And unless your replenishment is almost every day, you could be out for three or four days. But the key to me was understand what your bias is and be honest about it. My bias in this case was that without proper presentation and without understanding the product, and maybe my understanding of the product is incorrect, for example, I would, would ask about a specific toolbox that was very expensive, and I asked the salesperson, does that price point make sense? Because obviously it's designed for a pro, but even at that level, it's expensive. And we would have a conversation, and in that conversation, the biases would be obvious. My bias would be, hey, I think it's priced too high. His bias is, that's what they'll pay because they really need it. And to me, there's always going to be that bias trick is to be honest about it and have it out in the open. And, and I guess that would be a collaborative type process, SNOP or, or something where you're bringing in the science, you're bringing in here's what the forecast says, but then right. you're also bringing in that artistic side of it yep. and storytelling and saying, hey, this is what I'm seeing though. This right. is why I'm even questioning our statistical numbers because I see this. And then you're having a consensus discussion right. about it. Right. And to me, the you know people say that demand planning is part art and part science and i call it a craft because if you think of a craft you're really combining the two because you have to have the knowledge but you also have to have a sense of what it's supposed to be to bring the two together so i would i would challenge salespeople regularly on things like pricing presentation because i wanted to know what they thought why, when they said, hey, this promotion is going to produce a 20% lift and it had never happened before. Okay, how are you getting to that number? Show me the math. And it was an education to me because in some cases they were just basically throwing a number up in the air and hoping they could hit it. In other cases, they had done their math. They had done their homework and they had collaborated and they said, this is the number we can get to. And it's like, if, if you've done your homework, 
that's the number I'll go with because obviously you have thought it through. We've collaborated on it. Let's do it. Because I think a lot of what you're talking about really leads to that consensus or the one number type of attitude for sales, marketing, executives, your demand right. planning, because you're bringing everybody, you have the same information you're working with, the same assumptions then. Well, the other thing too is not to be afraid of having the conversations. Most people will say, hey, my number is not your number. Let's sort of have a sidebar conversation about that and see if we can agree. Put it right out in the open. You want 15,000 this month, the system in history says 12,500. Where are you going to get the additional 2,500? Where's it coming from? And have that discussion right out in the open rather than everybody sort of saying, well, I guess I'll go along with that number. It's close enough to mine. That's where you get in trouble because close enough and close enough and close enough over three or four months and you're way off. Yeah. And you can have that discussion and say, oh, by the way, I went to these six stores and this right. is what I saw. And it's right. not what we original assumptions were it was going to happen. Right. <laughs> and then also when it comes to promotions and new items to say, one of the things I would check on promotions was, is the price right? Because sometimes what they would do is move the inline product to the promotion and not change the price. And everybody's expecting a lift based on a different price. And the price is the same, which is why I took the photos and sent them to the salespeople, because if they're actually seeing what's in the store and it's wrong, they can then send the picture to somebody and say, Hey, this doesn't look right. So I think the, the last thing I want to touch on, since we're talking about this craft and we're talking about the unknowns uh, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes the science always doesn't pick up reality right. that's happening today. There's the elephant in the room or the, or the small little <laughs> microorganism in the room that's impacting our, uh, the world right now called COVID-19 right. as we're going right. through. When you're a demand planner, and you're faced with this black swan or these unforeseen events that's happening, that's impact type situation. How does that craft or that art really play into balance, you know, setting the right expectations, assumptions going forward, uh, you know, weeding through the science of the statistical models to really what's going to happen? How do we balance the science and the art part into a craft during these times that, that mm. we're going through right now. And I guarantee, uh -huh. you know, this podcast will live on in perpetuity right. in, for, in the future. So <laughs> we're going to go through something again in the future. So exactly. how do, how do we, how do we use the craft during these times? Well, I think the biggest thing is to understand what the data is telling us about each and every item and how it was impacted. And, and really in my mind, demand planning is mostly about data. That's where we live. That's where we work. That's what we work with. But we have to understand all the forces that can impact that data. And we have to understand, once we understand the data, the forces that impact it, then we have to move it into the future. And that moving it into the future to me really involves marketing and sales. In other words, we know what happened historically. This item was up, this item was down. We know that the salespeople have a budget to meet for next year and they have the challenge of trying to meet numbers that were skewed by an event that no one anticipated. So. We get, our, we get our numbers together. We have those conversations with sales and marketing about, hey, we know the history is not usable. So I went back two and three years to find what I thought was a reasonable pattern for um, that particular period, basically March through August and said, okay, if we base not our numbers, but our pattern on what we know was good history, and we take that and we move that into the next year, we're gonna have a much better picture of what could happen now we need to talk about are we going to have a vaccine what's the impact of the election are the customers going to move more and more online these are all conversations we need to have as we plan that year so that's where the science and the craft in my mind come together and it's also where we start to uncover the biases like next year is going to be really good because people didn't buy this and next year they'll really need it or next year is going to be really crappy because People have bought all of this and they're not going to need to come back for any more for another 12 months because it's not a consumable product. And that to me is, is where I think we hesitate because it's very time consuming to have those conversations, to go through the numbers, to set up a meeting that might take three hours. And what I tell the salespeople is we're not going to do this with every item. We're going to do this with the items that are most profitable for you. The other ones we're going to work on as they come up, but at least your top 20, 
or your profitable drivers for the coming year, those need to be nailed down. That's great advice. And it was a great conversation we had today. I want to thank you, Daniel. I mean, you're, in my opinion, you, you are a the the well-rounded demand planner. I, I, I like to you know wish everybody was uh, definitely going to be an asset to any organization out there uh, with your abilities and and you actually think, which is something I think we need as well. So I mean, I, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your insights on the craft mm-hmm. uh, from from an expert like yourself. And I, and I look forward to actually talking to you in the future and and, and following. Uh, what you do next. Well, thank you very much. This was enjoyable. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. As I, as I thought it would be, it was a great to hear his perspective of what exactly, you know, all the different components of a demand planning and forecasting and, and our roles actually are. He gave some great insights, not only to what we do as far as the modeling and, and math and statistical side of it, but also the craft as, as he mentioned it, that we have and, and, and what we do as well. And it, it gave a good whole picture of what, what it is. I mean, if you really look at this, I mean, we, we, it is a craft. I mean, he used those words, and I think it was a great, great word for demand planning uh, and exactly that type of role because it's really that both side of it. And with art, that's the product of expression and the internal side of it. You have... Yes, biases, but you have an internal understanding of your product, internal understanding of your data, internal understanding of your customer, the the internal understanding and expression. That's the art side of it. Science, on the other hand, is the exploration of the external and indisputed truths. We do that as well. The external the things that are impacting it, the variables, the indisputed truth of the science and the math. He didn't discount it at all. Matter of fact, he said, bring that in because that helps alleviate some of the bias and that will help explain why you're thinking certain things. So you're really bringing that, that expression of the internal feeling and the exploration of the external indisputed truths, bringing those two together, that's the craft of demand planning and forecasting and predictive analytics. And without a doubt, it really is both. I, 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 I've fought this before, if, if it's art, science, and management, you know, what exactly is we do? And, and it's really, undisputably, it is both of, of what you really need to do in demand planning. I, this is what I've done it in the past as well. I mean, a quick example, when I was working for a, a large mattress manufacturer, one of the things I did was I went out with the salespeople on sales calls for a week. I, I went out and traveled with them and understood exactly how they were selling the product, how the customer was receiving our product. And, and I actually went to these stores with the salespeople in the sales process. It was eye-opening and enlightening and extremely helpful to allowing me to forecast the product better. So I could say that it, you do need that creative side. You do need the imagination. You do need the art. The art helps you think outside the box. It helps you bring new insights in. The art opens up new solutions. Even in machine learning, the creativity side of it can make you think of new ways to, to go after a problem and solve. And, you, and the art helps you find those new solutions. The art helps you with feature selection or understanding the drivers, or understanding the variables that are really driving your forecast and business, understanding the customer. So art helps you with that as well. And then finally, art helps you paint a picture. We talked about the storytelling, or I mentioned that very briefly uh, that in the very beginning of this podcast, the storytelling that's necessary. We didn't touch on that. We probably should have with Daniel, but that storytelling side of it is really the artistic side of what you you have a canvas you're painting a picture to someone who doesn't understand the math someone who doesn't understand variables and 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 lags and and forecast you know mape they don't understand those things so you you're taking a canvas and painting a picture they can relate to you're tapping into your bob ross is what you're doing and that's really what we're talking about. So, so art is an intricate part of everything we do. And with that, one thing I w- want to leave you with is, is as one thing becomes commoditized, 
something else always becomes a premium. I talk a lot about predictive analytics. I got a book coming out about it. Probably when you're watching this, probably the book's already out on predictive analytics for business forecasting. So I talk a lot about the science part of it and data part of it. But guess what? As data and algorithms and everything, they're going to become a commodity as we go forward. Technology is going to be able to enable us to do that easier and easier. It's going to become commoditized. Something else becomes a premium. That something else is creativity. Knowing what questions to ask, how to interpret those and storytell to other people. That creativity and art is going to become more and more of a premium going forward as the science becomes more commoditized going forward. That brings us to an end of another wonderful podcast and episode of IBF On Demand. I am Eric. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. Questions, comments. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know what you think about the art side as well. And if I'm wrong or, it, why, you know, different things that you're doing maybe. And who knows? You have a good story. You find a, find a blog post or you email me. You may be on a future podcast. That's how it happens. I'm always looking for great guests. So let me know at eric at ibf.org. We have a sponsor with Archiva, your one plan SNOP so, uh, software solution. Check them as, as well. You can learn more about IBF at IBF.org and be part of this community. Continue to like, share, subscribe. And as always, don't forget, wash your hands. <laughs>